Hello, Manchester, and welcome to another edition of Gerard at Large. I am your cabin fever host, Rich Gerard. Thanks for tuning in. As you know, you can find us online at GerardAtLarge.com and also at Gerard at Large on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, where we encourage you to like us, to follow us, to subscribe to us so that you can get what we put out, when we put it out, and be able to share it with your friends. And we do encourage you to share these broadcasts and our blog posts, our Facebook and Twitter posts the same. Please help us get the word out to your family and friends and associates as we get the word out to you. And there are plenty of words we need to get out as the city of Manchester, state of New Hampshire, and the United States of America have completely and totally lost their minds in the wake of this so-called pandemic. I say so-called pandemic because we have not even come anywhere near close to the types of numbers we've seen in past pandemics. And those past pandemics did not require any sort of shutdown uh, on order of, uh, never mind on order of magnitude at all, as we have battled through these things time and again. A couple interesting studies came out, which I had the chance to find them online, but I heard about them in various radio shows and news reports. But uh, on one day earlier this week, the, both the University of Southern California, USC, and Stanford University released studies that uh, through their methodologies, two independent studies came up with basically the same conclusion. And what was that conclusion? The conclusion was the number of people infected with the COVID-19 virus, not to be confused with Ovid Lamontine, but COVID-19 virus is anywhere from 50 to 85 times the number of people that have uh, been reported to have it. They uh, basically sampled a demographically representative sample of people and uh, from antibody testing and uh, uh, COVID-19 testing, various testing formulas, they determined that the number of people infected is actually 50 to 85 times greater than the number of people that have currently been identified. If you remember, I think it was the Pacific Princess, whatever that, uh, that cruise ship that got stuck in Japan was, there were a couple of um, Stanford medical doctor uh, professors who were, their medical doctors and their professors at the medical school who did their statistical analysis of that. And at the time said that their estimates were that more than 6 million Americans by the time that ship had been infected had been infected by the disease. It would seem that these subsequent studies that are coming from uh, uh, different uh, researchers uh, are starting to confirm that. And I got news today, as I'm sure you did if you're paying attention, that uh, I think it was Governor Cuomo who said that it would appear that uh, from some uh, serology testing that's being done in, in New York State, serology testing meaning after the fact of testing for antibodies in um, in people who uh, may have had the virus, uh, it could be as much as 13% of New York State's population has already been exposed to the coronavirus. And that's significant, as Dr. Deborah Burks said when she was uh, confronted with questions from reporters about the USC and the uh, Stanford studies. That is significant because if 13% of the population of New York State, New York State, we'll say it's got 25 million people. I think it's more like 29. But uh, if we take a look at the numbers of people who have been infected and uh, either had no or mild symptoms, and we add that to the pool of people that have been infected, that means that the death rate, the mortality rate of this virus is actually no higher and in fact, may be lower than that of the flu. It also shows you that for all of the social distancing and all of the things that we have put ourselves through as a country, destroying the economy, destroying the livelihoods of 26 million American families, among other things, what we've done is not actually slow the spread of the virus. 13% of the population has already been infected with this virus. What's that tell you, folks? Well, there should be good news in that because it tells you the mortality rate is exceedingly low. It tells you the number of people who get really, really sick from this are, is exceedingly small. And it tells you that the vast majority of people who've been affected by this virus 
have in fact not been adversely or seriously adversely affected at all and have developed immunities to the virus. That's the whole herd immunity thing, which really is nature's way of, try, of preventing these things from coming back. Remember the whole idea of slow the spread was to preserve hospital capacity. It wasn't to make sure fewer people got infected. It was to make sure hospitals weren't overrun. And so we're gonna bring this a little bit more local now because the state of New Hampshire, while other states across the country with problems on similar order of magnitude of ours are starting to open up, or even worse in some cases, are starting to open up their states. Governor Sununu is saying it's going to quote, be weeks in all honesty, end quote, before New Hampshire really starts to tighten its grip. Now that may have changed because as we are recording this, we understand the governor is holding a press conference to give everybody an update. But the last update I saw, he basically said, because he's worried that if we start to open up uh, New Hampshire again, people from Massachusetts will flood across our border and infect the state, he is going to uh, be taking it at a much slower pace than perhaps our own state's numbers would uh, imply. Now, here's the problem with what I see as the governor's approach to this and his position on this. And that is, um, you know, he's saying that to meet the president's guidelines, we have to have two weeks of declining numbers. And we don't have that in New Hampshire yet. And to some degree, that's true. The problem is when you take a look at uh, a couple of things, you have to wonder just how long it's going to take New Hampshire to get to that point. New Hampshire has one of the lowest uh, and that's not a good thing, by the way. It has one of the lowest per capita testing rates in the country, which means uh, we are testing fewer people per thousand than most states in the nation. And so as testing ramps up, as we do more and more testing, as we expand the testing, as the governor says we're going to do, we are naturally going to find more people who uh, may have been or have been or are infected. So if, if you're going to scale up your testing and you're going to scale up your testing along the same lines that we've been doing and basically testing only people who are suspected of being positive, then you're going to see an explosion in the numbers. You're going to make it look like the number of cases is climbing, 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 when what's really climbing are the number of tests. And so there's a hazard there. The other hazard is this, and it's going to get back to something um, that we talked about with all of the people who've now been projected to have been infected and have had uh, mild, moderate, or no symptom, uh, symptoms of the virus is this. Um, we are not paying attention to where our numbers are coming from. Let me give you an example here. I'm gonna share the screen and I'm going to uh, bring this up, share, okay. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, get back to this uh, thing in a minute. Um, oh, too many, where is it? Okay, CMC furlough, restart now. Oh, darn it, I closed the page. All right, so here's the deal, the page that I closed, let me come back before we go to more. The, the page that I closed, was a story, and you probably caught it, about uh, an, Easter, an Easter Seals uh, a facility here in the city of Manchester. It teaches disabled children. There were 36 people as the state now is, is expanding, right? The state is saying, oh, long-term care facilities, we have a problem there. And that's something else the governor is not really paying attention to, in my never-to-be-humble opinion, as your ever-humble host, and that is where the numbers in New Hampshire are coming from. So many of our uh, confirmed cases and our, our sad deaths are coming from nursing home facilities or other kinds of long-term care facilities like this Easter Seals school that uh, takes care of disabled children in the city of Manchester. So here's a place, here's an idea, especially with the nursing homes and the assisted living facilities, the so-called long-term care facilities. These are places that have been on absolute lockdown. And I know this personally because my mother, as I shared with you a couple weeks ago, was in a nursing home. She fell, she broke her hip, she needed several weeks of rehab. And we went for over a month without being able to see my mom because it was nobody in and nobody out except the staff. And as the staff was coming in before each shift, 
They were having their temperature taken. They were being required to sanitize their hands after they sanitized their hands when they got to their workstation. They were being required to wash them. They were being asked all kinds of questions about whether or not they had certain symptoms, where they had been, had they been exposed to anybody, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it was extremely difficult. Um, it, 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 was, it was locked down like nobody's locked down um, in and out of these facilities. Yet, if you take a look at facilities in Manchester, Nashua, Dover, Salem, Concord, you take a look at all of these places where there have been big outbreaks. Hanover Hill in Manchester alone accounts for at least 50 cases of COVID-19 in the state and at least four deaths. And a funny thing about a lot of the deaths in the nursing homes, if you think about this, and I, have, I, I know someone who works at a nursing home who was explaining this to me, they said, look, a lot of the people in these nursing homes have do not resuscitate orders. So if they have do not resuscitate orders and say an intervention like a, um, um, a ventilator would, would save them, they, they have no, uh, they have do not resuscitate orders. They have directives not to use a ventilator or any extraordinary means to keep them alive until they recover. So those are deaths that may not have happened, right? So if 10% of the state's deaths are coming out of one nursing home facility in the city of Manchester, and if at least 50 of the confirmed COVID-19 cases are coming out of one nursing facility in the city of Manchester, you have to start to ask yourself, do we have a general problem in the population or do we have a, a specific set of problems with a particular type of facility? And if, we have, if, if that's the case, and by the rough estimates that I've been uh, that I've done, uh, based on news reports, anywhere from 20 to 25 percent of the COVID-19 cases, COVID-19, not to be confused with ovid um, uh, in the state of New Hampshire, are coming from nursing homes. Or now, because we've got this school in the city of Manchester, which uh, uh, isn't takes care of disabled children on a 24/7 basis, right? 36 cases were identified in that school when the state started doing its long-term care facility testing. You know what's funny about that? Not one of the people, some were, uh, some were the students, but most were the staff. Not one of the people who had COVID-19 or were found positive for COVID-19, not one of them had symptoms. What's that tell you? That tells you there are a lot of people out there who have it or have had it and didn't know it because there was no reason for them to know it. And if that's the case, then what we really should be doing is, in my opinion, con sure, continue with the test to determine if people have it or not so you can isolate the ones who have it. That's fine. But it's really time for us to start doing the did they have it test, the serology tests. And what are we going to discover? ladies and gentlemen of our large and loyal audience. What is going to be the truth of this situation if we find out, like is now the presumption in the state of New York, that 13, 15, 20% or more of our population has had the COVID-19 virus? You know what we're going to discover? We're going to discover that slow the spread didn't slow the spread we're going to discover that despite everything, the virus still infected a significant percentage of our people. But that's actually good news because it will mean a significant percentage of our people will have developed an immunity to it. But more importantly, it will, it will, it will, t it will put in proper context the mortality rate. Because after all, remember, millions of people were going to die based on computer models, which have proven to be about as right in this COVID-19 situation as they have with global climate change. And if we ever had any doubts about whether or not the computer models that were predicting global climate change were right we, or, or wrong, that all got exposed when those Cambridge researchers in England who gave us the hockey stick graph that showed us what was going to happen. Yeah. Remember their emails got hacked and released. And what did they show? They showed that they deliberately fabricated the data to illustrate the point that they wanted to illustrate. In other words, the whole thing was a hoax. Now, I'm not telling you COVID-19 is not real. I'm not saying that at all. 
In fact, I can tell you quite honestly, I do know people who have been infected by the virus. Uh, I do know people who have died from the virus. Uh, so I'm not being cavalier about this at all, but I think we have to start asking ourselves the very pointed question about why we are dislocating entirely our country. Why, you know, someone said to me the other day, they said, you know, I am no longer worried about um, my life. I am worried about preserving my life. I'm worried about preserving the life that I have built. Person's a business owner, person has a family, person cannot make money because the person is a so-called non-essential business and is essentially out of business as a result of this. And he's trying to figure out how it is he puts his life back together if he can. It's not likely he will be able to redo what he has done because he has just flat been put out of business, which is a tragedy for him, a tragedy for his family, and a tragedy for all of the people he employed, all of their families, um, and where do you go from that? Because eventually the now $3 trillion that the Congress has appropriated and given to we, the people of the United States, not counting the $4 trillion that authorized the Federal Reserve to give to the big banks and all those other corporations. So we're now $7 trillion into this, and we've got people talking about yet another stimulus bill. There is, at what point does this come home to roost? Okay, so the Congress has directly appropriated three quarters of an annual budget of the United States in the last month. We didn't have uh, enough money to pay for the $4.2 trillion that was appropriated, so we borrowed about a trillion. Now we've borrowed another $3 trillion. We're just printing the money. At some folks point, folks, this is going to be a very, very, my prediction, this is going to have lasting, this is going to have generational damage um, to the, the climate and culture of the United States and to our ability as an economy to function. And that's before we get into the horrific overreach of government at all levels as they try to save us from ourselves. Look, pretty clearly, you know, I need a haircut. Am I not adult enough to figure out whether or not the barber that I go to um, is taking proper precautions to give me a haircut? You know, the governor of Georgia, who uh, will start to reopen his state on Friday, I think it's the 25th, I don't know, even know what day, it's the 24th, is taking all kinds of flack, including from the president, which upset me greatly the way he threw uh, Governor uh, Kemp under the bus. Uh, by disagreeing with his decisions. You know, I watched an interview with Governor Kemp, and if I had time, I'd share it with you, but he was interviewed on Fox News by Martha McCallum. I encourage you to look it up. The governor of Georgia with Martha McCallum on Fox News. Uh, and he was, he was very clear about what they were doing, how they were doing it, why they were doing it. And he basically said, look, people's lives are being destroyed by this. Suicides are up. Mental health issues are off the charts. There are all sorts of people who are, who, who, who are not getting treated in our hospitals because we, we can't let them in because of this COVID-19 thing. We're waiting for a wave that isn't coming. Georgia, a state with 11 million people, has got 20,000 cases of COVID-19. Now, do the math on that. 20,000 cases in 11 million people. If 1% of, of, of Georgia had that, it would be 110,000 cases. This is crazy, folks. Absolutely ridiculous that we're doing this. And he's getting beat up because he's going to let people, he's not ordering these businesses to open. He's saying, you may reopen barbers, massage parlors, salons, uh, nail salons, uh, beauty salons, you know, women with their hairdressers, whatever they call that thing. Uh, I think bowling alleys, which is kind of a curiosity to me, but okay. Um, do I not trust my barber to wash your hands or to use hand sanitizer? Or if not feeling well, wear a mask. By the way, you folks who are out there wearing masks, I gotta tell you, when they're under your nose, they're not working. <laughs> That's a significant percentage of you. And not for nothing, the masks, unless you're wearing one of the N95 masks, which is highly unlikely, but these bandanas, these 
they do not block the virus. They don't. The purpose of wearing the mask is so that if you sneeze or you cough, you're not projecting the virus as far away as you otherwise would. So you people who are driving around in your cars all by yourself with the mask on, or you're taking the dog for a walk with the mask on, or any, you're not protecting yourself from anything, nor are you protecting anyone from anything else. And I renew my question. If I can go to the grocery store, if I can go to the pharmacy, if I can go into a restaurant to take something out of the restaurant, why can't I go to church? And I will say this right here, I call on Bishop Peter Labashi to trust his flock, to uh, uh, not go to church if they are ill, to properly social distance from other families in church um, when they're there, but reopen your churches, Bishop. Reopen your churches, please. It's not, it doesn't make any sense that I can go to the grocery store and I can spend two or three hours in the grocery store shopping, but I can't spend an hour in church. It doesn't make any sense. Maybe the governor's afraid that if we open our churches, there'll be a flock of Catholics that come from uh, Massachusetts to go to mass. Maybe there will be. Since when is people going to church a bad thing? So here's the deal. We do have the ability now to know who is infected. We have lots of testing capacity. There is no shortage of testing. The president has been clear about that. Dr. Burks has been clear about that. Dr. Fauci, who I think is a tool, has been clear about that. This is the same Dr. Fauci who back in January said the president didn't need to shut the country down, that there was no threat to Americans uh, from the coronavirus. Yeah, that Dr. Fauci. Um, so. They've all, they, they, they've all said it, <laughs> they've all said it, okay? So there's plenty of testing capacity uh, and the states just need to use it, fine. So we should be quarantining the sick, we should be warning the, um, the vulnerable, we should let everybody else go about their lives, okay? If we fast track anything at this point, it should be the tests that tell us whether or not we, we've had the virus. And my belief is that the federal government will not be as aggressive in rolling out those tests as they have the other tests, because if it is found that a significant percentage, and by significant, I mean anything in excess of 10%, because anything in excess of even 5%, but anything in excess of 10% is going to dramatically change what we know about this virus in terms of how it affects people and what the real mortality rate is. And the mortality rate has been the hammer that they have used, right? You had Governor Cuomo on, you know, in his news conference today saying, oh, people, the, the, the price of this is death. No, the price of this is not death, not even close for the overwhelming majority of people. And those who have sadly been affected by this, who have, who have, uh, uh, I won't say died as a result of it, but died with it, where it was a comorbidity, which is, which is the term, because we're still getting these stories about how people, you know, if someone fell out of bed and broke their head open and died of that head wound, they would count it as a COVID-19 death if the person had COVID-19 or, as we learned last week from that uh, doctor in Minnesota, if it were later determined <laughs> that the person may have been exposed to somebody who did have COVID-19. You can't make this stuff up. So if you don't believe me, go watch last week's show. It is still on the YouTube channel. It's still on, on my Facebook page. And listen to what that doctor said about what they are being told about how to report alleged COVID-19 deaths. Okay? It's just something that you got to do because it is what it is. Now, locally... There's a lot going on. We are going to touch on the teacher's contract for those of you who want to, uh, to, to know more about that. But locally, let's, let's take a look at how this is affecting um, us here in the state of New Hampshire and the city of Manchester. So here's the deal. The Manchester finance director, this is from the union leader. You can go there and catch it. The Manchester finance director forecasts a $2 million budget deficit for fiscal uh, 20. 
Remember, Joyce Craig says, no reason for us to furlough the now 38 people they've identified as staying at home, not doing their job, but getting their full city paycheck. And don't believe her when she says it doesn't save us any money if we put them on unemployment because we're self-insured for unemployment. Oh, it certainly does save us money because unemployment at best will pay 45 to 50% of their, uh, of their salary. And then they can, they, they'll get the, the federal 600 bucks on top of it. So there'll be some of the people who get laid off who would actually make more money on unemployment than staying in the city's employee. Isn't that interesting? So Bill Sanders, but this is some really kind of weird convoluted math, right? The two thousand, the two million twelve thousand two hundred dollar deficit number is driven by an anticipated revenue shortfall for, shortfall of four point one four six million, which is roughly halved by forecast expense reductions. The lower expenditure includes four hundred ninety three thousand from the contingency account and three hundred thirty thousand in anticipated FEMA reimbursement at seventy five percent for COVID nineteen related costs. Uh, once, the, okay, so. Um, now, if this savings is coming from Joyce Craig's proposed uh, uh, spending freeze, folks, that's not going to materialize. Moreover, they just turned around and gave any of those savings, or at least some of them away, and I'll bet you it doesn't include this, because they okayed the contract with the Manchester teachers. We talked about this contract, and if you go to GerardAtlarge.com, you can see my full write-up and analysis of this, which I did share before the meeting, and I did uh, send it to the aldermen. But I want you to know that even though the Board of Aldermen voted seven to six to approve this contract, and uh, you should thank, let me see, Jim Roy in Ward 4, Elizabeth Moreau in Ward 6, uh, Joe Kelly at large, Ross Terrio in Ward 7, who worked very diligently, diligently as a member uh, of the Special Committee on Negotiations, Mike Porter in Ward 8, uh, and Keith Hirschman in Ward 12. They were the votes against it. Um, here, here's what you need to know. They are going to spend money in this year's budget that may be necessary to offset the revenue shortfalls the city has. And they played some shell games. You can read about them because I don't have time to go over it today. They played some shell games uh, with the money calling, you know, some of it one time and some of it operating and whatnot. But effective April 1st through the end of uh, the, the fiscal year, uh, teachers are going to get a one and a half percent pay raise, uh, except for the teachers at the very top step, they're going to get a thousand bucks. And so it's a, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty big number. They are relying heavily on the uh, additional one-time money that we got from the state to fund this pay raise. But we need to come back to this, um, this $2 million deficit number because one of the things that they kept asking the, uh, the, the budget director for the city, uh, for the schools, Karen DeFrancis, is will this contract lead to layoffs? Her answer was no. Now, I don't think she's being dishonest about that, though I would disagree, um, especially in the out years, that this contract uh, wouldn't lead to layoffs. But here's the thing. Manchester, people do not understand how Manchester's tax cap works, okay? So the tax cap allows the city, let's just say the uh, consumer price index is about 2% again this year, right? So if the city raised $100 million in taxes, that means next year it can raise $102 million. All right, but it can't just spend that $2 million. Before they determine how much can be spent, they have to take a look at the non-property tax revenues. So if there is a drop in revenue, and right here, take a look, we're being told there's a $4.1 million projected drop in non-property tax revenue. Before the city can increase spending, it has to take any new tax revenue raised by the tax, under the tax cap, and offset any revenue losses. So the city overall raises about $200 million a year in taxes, which means at 2%, they can raise $4 million more. Well, if you can raise $4 million more, but before you can increase spending, you have to offset this $4 million loss in non-tax revenue, that means you cannot increase spending. In fact, you're probably gonna to have to cut it. 
And if that as that, if that, if that, if that revenue shortfall continues to grow, okay, the, uh, the amount of money that needs to be cut to make up the difference between the loss in non-tax revenue and the increase in tax revenue is going to continue to grow. So Joyce Craig's budget, which the budget that she wrote and proposed, totally out the window. And if she had any sense, she would recognize that and she would propose a, you know, a COVID-19 budget that took this into account. Because if the aldermen don't want to cut spending, they're going to have to override the tax cap to make up for those non-property tax losses. So in this case, right, you have a $4 million decrease in revenue, a a $4 million increase in spending, they're going to have to, it, it's about break even. If we lose another million dollars in revenue, but they don't want to cut spending by a million dollars, they're going to have to override the cap to raise spending by a million dollars. Now, they're going to have to pay five million bucks, about a million and a half of which will come out of one time money next year. Uh, so, again, read the article um, to fund that contract for the schools. Folks, it's not there. It's just not there. You may think it should be there, but it's not. And this is one of the reasons why I opposed the contract is when you, when you use, well, let's put it this way, of the money that this, but that this contract is going to cost, cost the city over two and a half years, half of it is coming from one-time uh, state revenues. Half of it. That's a problem in and of itself, and it shows you that the contract is not financially sustainable. Now you add this COVID-19 mess to, to the mix, and uh, what do you got? All right, so this is what's happening on the city front. The contract be damned, or the, the, the situation be damned. And, and there were people, by the way, <laughs> you know, kudos to uh, Alderman Mike Porter, who fought hard on the question of the, uh, uh, of the absenteeism, right? Let me put the absenteeism in some sort of context for you. The teachers are committed and they think it's doable to lower the number of absences by 5%. Well, roughly speaking, sick time use, about 10,000 days a year, okay? Now, if you got roughly 1,000 teachers, that means on average, and I know the averages are misleading, and, and they are in this case, but every teacher is using um, 10 days on average, give or take. So what's 5% of that? Half a day? So you're gonna maybe, if you're successful, if you're considered successful, you're still going to have a horrific number of absences, but they, because you'll only be cutting about 500 sick days out from underneath the total of 10,000 that are being used. I'm sorry, folks, that's setting the bar low and, um, you know, crowing like you shouldn't when you miss it. So back to what's happening here in the state and things that need to be opened back up. So this is what's happening in, in the city. Then we have Kathleen Sullivan, former chairman of the Democratic State Committee, saying, use the $1.25 billion, which by the way, Governor Sununu won the lawsuit filed by the Democratic leadership of the general court, including Manchester's own Donna Susi, Right, they, they said that the governor was violating the law by following the emergency law, the, the law that gives him all of these emergency powers. And we really, by the way, folks, need to have a discussion about whether or not the governor of the state of New Hampshire, uh, or any governor, but we live in New Hampshire, should have the kind of authority that the law gives him in, quote, an emergency. Um, this isn't a knock on Governor Sununu. Um, because I, uh, but I, I got to tell you something, folks, when you take a look at the breathtaking uh, authority that the law conveys on the governor in a so-called emergency, um, you, you have to take note of it because it is absolute control. But on the law, the governor was right on this one because the law says that the governor gets to determine how to use these emergency funds, um, notwithstanding any other laws to the contrary, which means if the law basically says you have to go through the Joint Fiscal Committee, this law says, no, you don't, the governor has the authority. And Judge Anderson of, uh, I forget what superior court he's in, agreed with the governor's position. And not only did he, and agreed to dismiss the case, which means there's no reason to have a trial here. It's that cut and dry. So $1.25 billion, Kathleen Sullivan is 
uh, criticizing the governor because he thinks, uh, she thinks, that the governor is being too narrow in his use of the funds. And that, as the headline says, and I don't have time to read the whole article to you, but it's in the union leader. Uh, let me see what date. I can't see it because I got arrows in the way. April 8th, union leader. Okay, the governor should use federal aid and the, and the $115 million the state has in the rainy day fund, which is a sham, by the way. The state of Maine has got a billion dollars, or it did before they elected that Democrat governor of theirs, uh, in its rainy day fund. Um, to save government jobs. In other words, she wants on the state level what Manchester's doing. And in fact, she praises Joyce Craig and the, and the Democrat aldermen for voting to keep non-essential employees on the payroll, even though they're not going to work. And she says to lay them off would just add, uh, uh, would just make the economy in the state that much worse. Really? I mean, I don't understand uh, the, how Democrats think about the economy. So to take someone who's not working uh, and pay them their taxpayer-funded salary, even though the revenue isn't coming in to fund them, is somehow better than cutting those expenses and uh, having them collect unemployment uh, which the federal government has dumped an enormous amount of money into. Hmm. Okay. Got it. Keep people who aren't working on the government pay roll. That makes a whole lot of sense. What else could you do with this money? I have a thought. Remember last week we went over the, uh, the announced uh, layoffs, furloughs, salary reductions at Catholic Medical Center and the... Uh, Elliott Hospital, right? It's like, what was it? Uh, 700 people were laid off at the Elliott. 650 people had their pay cut. And prior to that, 700 people were being furloughed at um, Catholic Medical Center. But guess what? Catholic Medical Center has now doubled that number, saying they're going to furlough or cut the pay of over 1,300 workers. Oh, and not for nothing, the state of New Hampshire now has a hundred and uh, almost 150,000 people who have filed for unemployment. Yay us. Okay. So let's see. Catholic Medical Center said it will furlough or cut the pay of 1,337 employees, more than 40% of its workforce as the coronavirus epidemic has scuttled electri uh, elective surgeries and other services. The steps we have taken to protect public health and patient safety, however, had a dramatic and devastating impact on CMC. The hospital said in a statement on Tuesday, CMC lost approximately $11 million in March and are projecting a $60 to $70 million year-to-date loss by the end of June. Oh, my head. The Westside Hospital said 423 employees, about 13% of its workforce will be on a 60-day furlough starting Sunday. Another 914 employees or 29% will have their hours reduced. Leaders at the vice president level and above are taking a 15% pay cut and executive directors are seeing a 5% cut. New Hampshire hospitals are losing $200 million a month in revenue. Governor Chris Sununu told reporters Tuesday that restoring elective surgeries in hospitals is one of the first things he will flex open. The governor said he met with hospitals yeah, so how about uh, Kathy Sullivan, instead of using that money to keep unproductive, un not working state employees on the payroll, how about we keep the hospitals that we need to fight the battle um, open? I mean, this is, this is horrific. So what sense does it make to order hospitals to not do anything other than emergency only work so that we can trash them financially? And that article I shared with you last week from the Elliott, the Elliott is losing $24 million a month. CMC from April to the end of June, that's May, April, June, $70 million. April, May, June, that's almost what? 15 to $20 million a month? Folks, what are we doing? What are we doing? This is crazy. Oh, I know what we're doing. We're giving out pay raises that we can't afford. Never mind. 
Here are the articles about uh, COVID-19 spreading in long-term care facilities. Again, you can get this, um, <laughs> you know, at theunionleader.com. Uh, if a resident is, I, I, this is crazy. So we know, we know that these places are hotspots. And remember, they are on the most stringent social distancing lockdown that exists anywhere on the planet. It's literally no one in, no one out. And everybody who gets in, because they work there, has got to go through a temperature check. They get asked all the questions, blah, 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 blah. And still it's getting in there. What's that tell you, folks? What's that tell you? Okay, by the way, restartnow.io. This is a fascinating website that I heard about. I've only started to play uh, with it a little bit. Um, they're looking to raise funds so that they can come up with data on other states. But when you go to the states that they do have data on, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a wicked uh, detailed data-driven analysis of the state where its COVID-19 cases are, where they aren't, what the demographic of every county is, what businesses are there. And by the way, not for nothing, you're gonna start having real problems in the grocery store because several very large and very important uh, food processing plants across the country have been shut down in the last week to week and a half, uh, primarily meat packing plants, because employees at those plants have come up with COVID-19 and uh, so they've been shut down. In other places, people are afraid to go to work because they think to catch COVID-19, like Governor Cuomo so ir irresponsibly and ridiculously said, means death if you get it. No, it doesn't. Your idiot brother survived, which, by the way, the governor's idiot brother, you know, the one who staged his own reemergence from... Um, you know, his basement after self-quarantining while having COVID-19, the same Chris Cuomo, who uh, there is video of before CNN so dramatically, uh, you know, projected, you know, recorded him coming out of his basement for the first time ever in how many ever weeks to see his wife and his children. It was so dramatic, except there's video of him. And, it, you know, it's been all over the internet. You've seen it probably. Video of him getting into an argument with a uh, with a uh, a biker who who saw him walking around his neighborhood in the Hamptons and said, "Hey, you've got COVID nineteen. Shouldn't you be quarantined?" And by the way, not for nothing, the same thing happened with George Stephanopoulos of ABC News, the man who has been applauding things like uh, uh, sheriffs in Kentucky sitting outside the home of a COVID nineteen patient to make sure he doesn't leave. Uh, and otherwise, you know, telling people that they're, you know, urging the shut, oh, World Health Organization, criticizing the president for trying to open up the country, saying we should be shut down for another 18 months, oh my head. Right. So the same George Stephanopoulos who's out there cheerleading, there's video of him walking around, He and he has COVID-19, without a mask on, on a cell phone, walking around in his neighborhood. So you see, it's not just Joyce Craig who can tell everybody else that they should stay home while she goes for a walk with her COVID-19 positive daughter. It's Cuomo, it's Stephanopoulos. And speaking of the mayor, oh, so this restartnow.io website is one that you definitely need to, uh, to check out. Um, speaking of the mayor, oh, do I not have this? Oh, stand by. I guess I'm gonna have to open them up. Your screen sharing is paused. Cool. So that means you're just looking at me right now while I'm opening up these photos. So speaking of CMC and speaking of the, um, of the mayor, here she is. And um, outside of Catholic Medical Center. And what's she doing? She's holding a sign saying thank you to the um to the workers at cmc oh and there's congressman pappas yeah you know the funny thing about congressman pappas is you know the health department was all too quick to say there was nothing wrong at his restaurant after 18 people got sickened and one died during an event which they later tried to blame on employees which may or may not have been true 
Um, you, you know, and they didn't even warn the public that they should stay away after this deadly outbreak. I forget the name of the virus uh, that, that hit his restaurant. Didn't even bother to, uh, to release the name, the state of New Hampshire. Nobody told anybody that it was the back room where 18 people got sickened at an event and one died uh, as a result. Uh, but, you know, he's uh, out there, you know, brandishing the whole, hey, you know, coronavirus, we got to stay socially distant and all that fun stuff. So your screen sharing is paused. Can you guys see this? I'm, I'm, I'm confused by what my uh, thing is telling me. Anyway, so we have these uh, photos, which I'm not sure you're seeing. Stand by. Why is my screen? Oh, resume share. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm still a little new to this technology. Resume share. Well, I don't want that anymore. Okay, so CMC furloughs state report COVID-19 at Easter Seals. Oh, it's at the union leader. There it was. Okay, so this is the one where it said 36 people were tested. Rollins said 74 children and teenagers live at the school and about 300 staff care for them around the clock. 36 of them were test tested positive, positive um, and none of them ha were symptomatic. She said there are still enough people to care for all the children at the school. If too many of the school staff get sick, Rollins said Easter Seals will call up some of the 400 staff that have been furloughed after its non-essential programs had been suspended. Isn't that excellent? Okay, so COVID-19, we know it's spreading in long-term care facilities like the one governor saying too many COVID-19 cases to reopen the state for weeks. That was as of April 18th, just a few days ago. And then, uh, okay, we get the CMC story. Now, restartnow.io, take a look at it. It's got some wicked interesting data. And then finally, I want to get to the uh, to these pictures. Resume share. Hopefully it will let me do that. The sharing has stopped as the shared window is closed. No, the shared window. I want to share this. Screen share. Oh, I see how this works now. Sorry, folks. So here is Chris Pappas. We've already talked about that. And uh, Joyce Craig. And uh, let me see. I got to check something. I've got about 10 minutes left. Okay, gee, thank you. You see Officer Friendly there? Do you see in the background fire trucks? Fire trucks. We're going to be talking about that in just a minute. There's a ladder truck. Why is there a ladder truck there? So that the firemen can wave to the people in the upper floors who can't be down there for the mayor's political stunt. And yes, I'm going to call it the mayor's political stunt. And here's why. This was an event, uh, my sources tell me, was organized by the International Association of Firefighters. Okay, listen, I respect and appreciate what the, um, I respect and appreciate what the hospital workers are doing. Um, frankly, what they're doing is their job. I'm sure uh, hospital workers, healthcare workers are not strangers to uh, working in a place where people are sick, where there are infectious diseases, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I know that this whole COVID-19 thing has really put a strain on their lives. Uh, you know, a friend of mine uh, has been quarantined since this started because his wife is a nurse and she may contract the virus. So he's like not even going out to go grocery shopping. You know what I'm saying? I, I get it. Okay. I get it. Um, but what I don't get is how the firefighters union uh, with the mayor gets to use city firefighting apparatus closed down a city street, a major artery on the west side. McGregor Street was closed for this little stunt. You had police there, you had fire there, basically for an event staged by a private organization, that organization being the Firefighters Association. Now, if anybody else wanted to do something like that, what they'd have to do is apply for a permit from the city to shut down the street. They'd have to pay fees. They'd have to go through a whole process. It would have to be approved by uh, the Traffic and Public Safety Committee and then ultimately the Board of Mayor and Alderman uh, to go ahead and do something like this. So my uh, question is, is what was the city's uh, uh, state of readiness uh, for this to happen? How can the mayor, and there were other pictures that I, I, I had seen, but I couldn't locate again, where the mayor is taking a picture with all of these staff on the sidewalk in front of um, 
CMC, and they're all shoulder to shoulder, which is not social distancing, by the way, not social distancing, so shoulder to shoulder, even if you're wearing a mask, you're not supposed to do that, Madam Mayor, for what? So the, maybe, maybe we should be asking the union to reimburse the city for the use of the fire trucks. But then again, this is the same union, and this is the same fire chief, Dan Goonan, and this is the same organization that allowed Joyce Craig to shut down a fire station when she was running for mayor that went out on East Industrial Park Ave so she could do a photo op with fire trucks and uh, uniformed firefighters. They shut down the station so she could do a photo op and receive the endorsement of the International Association of Firefighters, Local 856, I believe it is, here in McQueen City. And now they're not just shutting down a fire station, they're taking a ladder truck and at least two other engines, shutting down, with the help of the Manchester police, a major thoroughfare in West Manchester, so they can stage this you know, political stunt saying, oh, we thank you so much. There was an interview on Channel 9 where one of the district fire chiefs basically, you know, well, we wanted to show our appropriate, well, who's we? Who organized this? Oh, it was the union who organized it, complicit with the mayor. They didn't follow any of the rules that anybody else would have to follow. See, I, this is why I tell you, Joyce Craig, the rules are for we the people, not for her, the leader. They don't have to do anything by the rules when she's involved. They just have to do what's convenient for her. And I don't know about you, but this is getting a bit tiresome. And then the following Friday, um, 16 Manchester police cruisers, 16 Manchester police cruisers on duty went to the Elliott Hospital to do a similar thank you to uh, their medical staff during their shift changes. Now, I don't know about you, but there have been many occasions where we have had to call the Manchester Police Department into our uh, downtown neighborhood. and. Uh, well, let's just say the response time wasn't what you'd hope it would be, right? I wonder what the response time was. Well, 16 on-duty cops with Manchester police cruisers were sitting outside the Elliott Hospital. It's, why, can't, why, why could not off-duty officers have gone and held up poster boards and signs without having 16 cruisers and on-duty officers there? Why could not the mayor or whatnot, uh, why, why could they have not have stood along the sidewalk with signs saying, thank you, CMC? Why did we have to have this great big production, all of this fanfare to shut down a street, use city, uh, on duty city apparatus, on duty city firefighters, so that um, you know the union could make some kind of big splash or whatever it was. Look, I'm all for saying thank you. All I'm saying is, why don't you do it with off-duty personnel without city uh, equipment and vehicles that may be needed at a moment's notice uh, and do it in such a way as you're not completely disrupting the, uh, the, the traffic patterns of an entire side of town? Absolutely outrageous. You, you know, if Ted Gatsis had done anything like that, you can only imagine what, uh, what would have happened. Um, and not for nothing, while we're on the topic of uh, Joyce Craig and the rules are for other people, uh, you may recall that million dollar fund that she wanted to have, this loan fund that she wanted to have to help, um, you know, struggling Manchester businesses through the COVID-19 ordeal, right? Uh, Manchester Development Corporation was putting up half a million dollars and she wanted to take half a million dollars out of the city's economic development fund which by ordinance requires 10 votes if it's gonna be used for anything other than economic development. And I think I told you at the time that I did not believe it was a, uh, a program, this, this loan bailout thing was a program that qualified based on my memory of, of that uh, account and what it was structured for. Well, um, the, the mayor, without any regard for what the actual rules were, said, nope, we don't need 10 votes to do it. And uh, it was, I think, an eight to seven vote with her breaking the tie, right? Okay, so Alderman Mike Porter, very, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just gonna say this. When I started in politics, I was Mike Porter's size, and by the time he's done, he's gonna be mine, because he's doing the kinds of things that I used to do when I was on the Board of Aldermen and the Board of School Committee, and he's taken the kind of beating that I took for it. But here's the deal. So, Mike, I want to congratulate you. But here's the deal with that. 
he actually found information from the city's bond council. What is bond council? Bond council are lawyers that give us advice on uh, uh, and, and tell us what we can and cannot do with our money. So when this fund was set up, economic development was uh, uh, um, economic development was considered the acquisition or the maintenance of quote capital assets. So if you wanted to buy land, if you wanted to um, uh, improve a piece of property or something along that line, right? You could use this fund. And if memory serves me correctly, that fund was used to buy the old Jack Pack uh, uh, meat packing facility down off of Queen City Avenue. And then it was used to uh, replenish when they sold it to the Elliott to build uh, El the Elliott at River's Edge, right? Okay, so that's the kind of thing that it was meant for. It wasn't meant to come up with bailout money for uh, uh, companies uh, affected by the coronavirus or, or anything else. You could do it, but you needed 10 votes because it's two thirds of the alderman elect to overturn that. And speaking of which, I've gotten a lot of questions. With the alderman, the, the aldermen do not need eight votes to approve a union contract. A, a uh, simple majority will uh, approve the contract. However, there is one more vote to get to um, on this matter. So um, it, it was passed to lay over. The final vote will be at, the, at their next meeting. So back to this. So Porter found the minutes of the meeting where the bond something where the bond council said uh, identified that it was for capital assets, and he brought it up and he asked uh, a city solicitor Emily Rice, who is nothing other than a political flat doodle for the mayor, uh, about that. She said, "Well, capital assets aren't really defined. She should be fired summarily." So Joyce, I'm sorry, Mayor Craig. Mayor Craig um, announced after Porter brought that up, because uh, my guess is they knew Porter was bringing it up, that she had not yet um, taken the money out of the CIP, because she had not yet executed what needed to be executed in order to make those funds available. And uh, she's held off. Even though the Board of Aldermen voted to approve it, she hasn't done it. Now, I didn't realize the mayor had the authority to not implement a vote of the board, but apparently she's gonna exercise it anyway. Um, and so uh, the thing is, is Porter and I think Lavasser have both said, if you do this because you're not following the law, you're not following the purpose of this account, we're gonna file for an injunction. So Joyce has pulled this, they can't file for the injunction until the money actually changes hands from a, uh, uh, until it goes from the economic development account to the CIP account they created to, you know, allegedly bail out these struggling businesses. So she is preventing them from getting the judgment she knows the court is going to give by not transferring the money. So one may wonder what's going to happen here, and I'm not sure. Maybe she's going to try to get it in the budget instead because she may have the votes to do that. Maybe they're going to solicit applications for it and present the alderman with, that's my timer, that means I'm almost done, and present the alderman with a, uh, you know, with a list of businesses who desperately need this money to reopen as a way of trying to back them into a corner and give them the 10 votes that they need in order to take the money out. I don't know, but it bears watching. Um, and so, the, the, the mayor who does not believe the rules apply to her if they get in the way of what she wants to accomplish um, may have been outsmarted uh, on this one by Alderman Mike Porter. So we'll tip our hat to him on, uh, you know, on that one. And I am out of time, folks. As always, I am your ever humble host, Rich Gerard. Thanks for tuning in. Until next week, be good, be well. Don't do anything we wouldn't do. We're proud to have in the audience. Thanks so much for being there. Please share this with your friends on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Go subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and make sure you're helping us get the word out about what's really happening here in the Queen City and the Granite State. Till next week, be good.